I want to welcome everybody back to the Week in Review. It's our fifth edition. we got a big show on tap for you. We're going to talk about podcasts. Apparently the kids are into these things. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I was on two of them this week, and we're going to talk about that. We're also going to go back and look at the latest developments in two congressional races here in South Carolina. Uh, that's going to segue nicely into a story about a visit from former, future, exiled, whatever you want to call him, crazy President Trump, Donald Trump, coming to South Carolina. Beyond that, we're going to look at the legislative process, particularly a key legislative committee that has stalled, hasn't met all year. Republicans are starting to get very worried about that over at the State House. We're going to look into that. We've got some news on the statewide front, the race for attorney general. And as we pull the lens back and look at all these elections, we're going to talk about election reform, which came to the fore this week in a big article that we released. Uh, we've also got some news about transparency and officer-involved shootings. There were some developments on that front this week. We're going to talk about those. And last but not least, does Joe Biden have a secret plan to stop inflation? What is inflation? I've got to look that up on Wikipedia. No, I'm kidding. I know what inflation is. But we're going to talk about all this and more on this week's Week in Review. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about this week is podcasts, our podcasts. I don't understand podcasts, okay? I've got a very short commute. I live literally right around the corner from where I work, so I don't have a lot of time in the car. And if I do have time in the car, I'm not going to play some like Ramones or Sex Pistols or Ninth Symphony or something, not a podcast, right? I don't know. I don't understand why people who hear other people talking all day want to get in their cars and then listen to other people continue to talk. I, but anyway, they're popular. They're popular. Uh, and apparently, um, one of them wanted me to come on this past week. In fact, not one actually, but two. And I want to talk about two of them because I actually had a really good time. I kind of was surprised at how much I enjoyed being on a podcast. Now, does that mean I'm going to enjoy listening to podcasts? I don't know yet. I don't know yet, but I did enjoy being on them. It was a lot of fun. So I want to talk about the first one. All right, there are these two guys, right? They're former state senators. Uh, one of them, his name is Joel Lurie from Richland County. Uh, the other's named Vincent Shaheen. He's from Kershaw County, which is right next door to Richland County, if you're heading on Interstate 20 to the east, I think. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. He's around there somewhere. But anyway, two nice guys, both Democrats, both served in the state Senate for a long time. Um, some of you may know Vincent Shaheen. He ran for governor of South Carolina uh, in 2010 and 2014. Lost both times to somebody I know a little bit about, Nikki Haley, but... We'll save that for another uh, Week in Review episode. But these guys run a podcast. It's called Bourbon in the Back Room, and it apparently is very popular with the state house crowd, like with the political insiders. But when I went on the show, it quickly became clear to me after it aired that a lot more than just political insiders listened to this thing. I heard from a ton of people in and around Columbia and other parts of the state that were following this podcast. And it's a really cool format. It's very conversational. Um, uh, Joel and Vincent are you know, again, both Democrats, but they don't try to push their ideas on the show. It's just very free-flowing, conversational. Um, they let you tell good stories. Um, they tell good stories. And of course, as the name of the podcast suggests, uh, both of the hosts are knocking down some copious amounts of bourbon during the filming. So that, that tends to make things interesting. But I had a really good time on the show. And also the week after our episode aired, um, Tom Davis, State Senator Tom Davis, who's come on this program, he was on the show talking about his medical marijuana bill. So they get great guests. Uh, it's a great format. So I would encourage you, if you haven't listened to it yet, please check out Bourbon in the Back Room. Um, you can check it out uh, at this web address or on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. So I just want to give a shout out to those guys because I really had a good time on their show. And I would encourage you to listen and check it out. The second podcast I was on this week much bigger deal. Um, not to knock Joel and Vincent and those guys, but this second podcast, the Murdoch Murders podcast, has been like one of the top Apple podcasts in the country all year. Uh, in fact, dating back to last year. And it was started by Mandy Matney, our own news director, who's working with her fiance, David Moses, and with our executive editor, Liz Farrell, and a bunch of other good folks down there in the low country to produce this podcast that's following the Murdoch Murders true crime saga. Again, this is a story Fitz News broke. Uh, we've been driving it for months now, uh, covering almost all of the major developments in this case exclusively and bringing the context that readers crave about this story, which again has captured national and international attention. But 
this week I had the opportunity to go on with Mandy on the podcast, and it was my first time on Mandy's podcast, so just a huge podcast week all around, but this was just an incredible episode. Um, Mandy and her team are just doing an amazing job there, and it was uh, very informative for me, too, to not only learn what they're learning as they do that format, but also provide some of the info that we've covered on Fitz News, and in particular, some of the more detailed history of the Murdochs and their relationships with some folks down in the Palmetto Low Country who've been linked to drug smuggling. Now, am I saying the Murdochs are drug smugglers? Not necessarily. Uh, they are definitely involved with some folks who have been linked to that industry, and there's some very questionable property connections, um, incorporations, joint incorporations, um, financial transactions, just all sorts of things that really don't add up. And of course, there's history here too, and one of the things that I talked about in the podcast with Mandy was some of the history that we uncovered along with our researcher, Jen Wood, who's been doing some great work on the Murdoch story, some of the history we uncovered. And so I think Dylan, our special projects director, has got a clip queued up from that show, Dylan. Let's roll with it. Let's check it out. Properties, and we found nine in particular that were located at what you can only call, looking at them on the map, strategic access points, and literally perfect places for lookouts to watch out for Coast Guard patrols or local law enforcement boats. Um, you know, just the ideal places to signal somebody, hey, they're coming, or hey, we got a boat here, or hey, you know, hurry up and get everything offloaded, you know? I mean, literally, look, look out properties. All right, so the next thing we're gonna talk about this week Congressional updates, and again, I don't want to like throw my back out, pat myself on the back here. Dylan has told me, go easy on the self-congratulation, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not take too big of a bow to throw my back out. But again, so you look at the congressional races in South Carolina, we've been calling it for a while. In fact, I want to pull up a clip here. This is from a year ago, over a year ago, actually. We we're talking about former state representative Katie Arrington being courted as a challenger to incumbent Nancy Mace in the first congressional district in South Carolina. Now, Mace won this seat back in 2020. She took it from Democrat Joe Cunningham, who himself defeated Katie Arrington. So we've got a very interesting dynamic here. We've got a former GOP nominee for Congress who lost uh, her bid for this seat to a Democrat. Uh, Nancy Mace then comes in, beats the Democrat, and now Katie Arrington and Nancy Mace are running against each other. And this race has big national implications, just like the race up the coast in South Carolina's 7th Congressional District, because you've got two districts where you've got lawmakers who are either, quote, disloyal or insufficiently loyal to Trump, uh, per Trump's belief. Uh, Trump wants to take both of them out and has now endorsed uh, challengers in both of these districts. Now, one of the districts, former South Carolina governor and former UN ambassador under Trump, Nikki Haley, has endorsed the incumbent, basically going against Trump. And what, what I'm gonna be interested in following, what I haven't really addressed yet on the website, but you're gonna hear about it now on the Week in Review first, I wanna know what Nikki's gonna do in that seventh congressional district, because not a lot of people know this, but uh, a decade ago, it was Nikki Haley's endorsement that propelled Tom Rice to his victory in the seventh congressional district. In fact. When Tom Rice voted to impeach Trump last January, Republicans were so upset, they actually got upset at Nikki Haley for her role in putting him in office a decade ago. I mean, that was how angry these Republican voters were at Tom Rice. Nikki Haley got what I guess you would call a spillover bitch out, really. Um, so following both of these races over the next couple of weeks, it's gonna be incredibly interesting to see what unfolds. But before we get to that, Trump has already endorsed in these races. and. One of the endorsements we predicted last week happened this week. And how did Nancy Mace respond to it? This is a pretty interesting clip. She put it on social media. Let's cut to that clip and see what she had to say. Hey, everyone. Congresswoman Nancy Mace here. I, I'm in front of Trump Tower today. And um, I remember in 2015 when President Trump announced his run. I was one of his earliest supporters. I actually worked for the campaign in 2016. I worked in seven different states across the country to help get him elected. I supported him again in 2020 because of policies I believed in. He brought American jobs back. He lowered our taxes, wages, and employment were better for every hardworking American in our country. He made America safer, and he took on China directly. And America was stronger all around the world. And, and quite frankly, freedom and democracy was stronger all around the world. And 
These are things I still believe in today, policies that I believe in and continue to. As a strong fiscal conservative, I believe in putting America first. I believe in putting our country back on the path to prosperity. But Nancy Pelosi would love nothing more than to win this seat back in the midterm election cycle. She did it in 18, and she can do it again uh, this cycle. And I was elected to represent the people of the first district. I won this seat back for Republicans in 2020. And if you want a Republican majority, if you to thwart the radical far left DC Democrat agenda, then we've got to keep the seat in Republican hands. We've got to get a majority back. If you want to lose this seat once again in midterm election cycle to Democrats, then my opponent is more than qualified to do just that. If you want a Republican majority, if you want someone to continue to represent the low country, if you want someone to represent the low country with our fiscally conservative values, then I'm here to serve. Okay, I'm trying to figure out what, what happened there. So Trump didn't endorse you. You still endorse Trump. But I don't think that was the point of the video, was it? I think the point of that video was to dog out her new rival, Katie Harrington, basically saying, girl, you had your chance, you got beat. You lost the seat, I had to come in and take it. Now, who's better in the general election? Katie Arrington or Nancy Mace? In other words, which Republican would be better conceivably in a race against a Democrat this fall? Because there is a good, uh, not good, I guess, well-funded, credible Democrat running for this seat. So which Republican would be better? I don't know. May certainly seems to think it's her. So that's going to be an incredibly interesting race to watch moving forward. And once again, to get the heads up on all this, a lot of this news was broken by our news outlet a couple of weeks ago. I'm glad the mainstream media is finally catching up to it. But for the very latest on both those congressional races, keep it tuned to FitzNews.com, where we've got all the latest breaking developments. All right, so one of the other stories we're covering this week involves Lauren Martell, an attorney from Bluffton, South Carolina, who is running for attorney general against third-term incumbent Alan Wilson. Martell's candidacy took an interesting turn this week when she was accused of obtaining false medical information from a law enforcement officer and then using it to manipulate a court hearing involving one of her clients. This is a custody case down in the low country. For the latest on that, let's go to Liz Farrell down in Hilton Head. Hi guys. Today I wrote about Lauren Martell, who is a Bluffton attorney that is running against South Carolina Attorney General Alan Wilson in the Republican primary. On Friday, a woman in Bluffton filed a lawsuit against Lauren Martell saying that she had defamed her in a divorce case that she was representing the wife in. And this is actually the second time that Martel has been accused of defaming somebody. Back in April of 2020, just after the restrictions went into play with COVID, uh, her brother was in a situation with a tow truck driver. And afterward, Lauren posted videos of the interaction that her brother had with the tow truck driver and with a Beaufort County Sheriff's Office deputy. That tow truck driver ended up suing her for defamation, and the case settled shortly before she announced her run for attorney general. The story is on fitznews.com. You should check it out. All right, I want to thank Liz for that report. Now, this race took another interesting turn this week when the attorney general published an opinion from his office related to the issue of medical freedom. Now, for those of you who haven't been following this race, uh, Lauren Martell is running against the attorney general from the right. Actually, she's running from the far right, like really, 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 really far right, um, arguing that he has not done enough to protect medical freedom, to protect a patient's relationship with their doctor, their right to try experimental medication. Now, this week, though, in the opinion that was just released from his office, the AG took a very decisive position on that issue, arguing on behalf of patients' freedom, on behalf of their right to try some of these experimental uh, COVID-19 treatments like ivermectin. And again, I don't know if these things work, right? I was a good boy. I got my shots. I've had COVID twice, maybe three times. I should be pretty good, right? Not too worried about it. Also, if you're younger, uh, in relatively good health, this virus really was never much of a threat to you, okay? But again, if you got a doctor, you want to try something, I'm, I'm for the right to try, man. I mean, I'm a libertarian. Uh, I believe in that sort of thing. I think people ought to be able to try whatever they want, right? If they get a doctor that recommends it. Um, so I don't really have an issue with that. And K-12 
case history, as the Attorney General cites, is very protective of that doctor-patient uh, relationship and, incidentally, also protective of off-label uses of medication. So I think the Attorney General's opinion on this issue was very strong, and if you want to read more about it, check out the story we ran on that just this weekend on fitznews.com. All right, while we're talking about COVID-19 and health issues, there's a very interesting development at the South Carolina State House. There is a committee in Columbia in the South Carolina House of Representatives, actually one of the busiest, most influential committees in all of state governments, actually where the majority of legislation introduced in the House is sent to. It's the House Judiciary Committee. This panel has not met all year. Actually, let me take that back. It met once, but it met under an acting chair because the chairman of this committee has apparently had complications from COVID. Had COVID, apparently developed some conditions following that that have kept him out of action for over a month now. Uh, now, why is this interesting? Because when the chairman of a committee is out of commission, the first vice chairman of that committee is supposed to assume his or her duties. Now, in this case, that's a representative from Lancaster named John King. John King is a Democrat. He is not liked by Republicans. He's, in fact, not liked by some folks in his own party, kind of a controversial, outspoken guy. Uh, I've had some run-ins with Representative King in the past. We've butted heads on various issues, including judges. Um, but rules are rules, uh, right? I mean, we pass rules. We ought to live by the rules, right? Particularly the lawmakers, the ones who pass laws. It, it could be argued that they should probably follow the laws and the rules they pass, right? novel concept. But King has not been allowed to assume the reins of this committee. In fact, rather than give him the reins of the committee, the committee has just decided not to meet. And this is significant because this is a committee that's tasked with looking at some incredibly important issues that affect everybody in South Carolina. Uh, and one of those issues is election reform, which this news outlet has talked about a lot this week and which we're going to get into in here in just a minute. But before we do that, I did want to point out that this is a big development when you've got one of the most, again, active, important, influential legislative committees in all of state government simply not meeting because they don't want to hand the reins over to a Democrat. Which raises another question. If Republicans outnumber Democrats in the South Carolina House by a two-to-one margin, which they do, why don't you have another Republican in your number two spot? That would seem like the logical thing to do if you were going to, you know, I don't know, continue to run the government along your ideological lines. Not that there's much difference in South Carolina between Republicans and Democrats. But anyway, the point is this. Whatever the reason, you shouldn't hold up the people's business just because one guy got sick. It's next man up. And in this case, the next man up is John King. So for more on that, check out FitzNews.com. But we're going to be following this story very closely in the coming week to see if lawmakers get this committee moving again. So as I referenced in that last clip, one of the issues that the committee that isn't meeting is supposed to be addressing is election reform. Uh, and there are a couple bills that have been presented by the Republican leaders in the General Assembly this year to address errors, inconsistencies, uh, vulnerabilities, if you will, in our current election administration. Now, do I think the bills that are before the General Assembly this year constitute real reform? No, I do not. And I'll tell you why. A couple things. Number one, they don't fix a broken structure. In South Carolina, we've got a very duplicative sort of layered approach to managing elections. We've got a commission which appoints a director and they're under the governor, sort of. That doesn't work. Uh, I've said it, uh, if I've said it once, I've said it a million times. If you've got splintered accountability over something, you've got no accountability. And in South Carolina, we need somebody where the buck stops when it comes to election problems. So that's number one, the structure's wrong. Number two, we've got a bunch of freewheelers at the local level who are responsible for administering local elections. And that's where 99.9% .9 of the problems are, people. It's not necessarily statewide elections, which are generally pretty smooth, pretty well administered. It's at the local level. And as long as you have local officials that are elected by their legislative delegations, again, just like the judges, the problem here are, are the lawmakers who appoint these local cronies to these little election fiefdoms. No, we got to scrap that. We got to make all of these local election commissions political subdivisions of the state, which means putting them under that singular election official and having real accountability over that system. 
But most importantly, once you get the structure right, you got to have ballot integrity, ballot security. To me, that starts, whether you're doing mail-in or in-person, that starts with voter identification, an ID, a signature, and if you're doing mail-in, a witness. Again, this isn't complicated. I, I think Donald Trump's wrong about mail-in voting, guys. I said this in the video earlier this week. I'll say it again now. I think Donald Trump is wrong. I think mail-in voting can actually be more secure, more secure than in-person voting, because you can create a paper trail. Not only do you have a signature, not only do you have a witness, but you have somebody sign an affidavit that says, hey, I acknowledge that if I commit voter fraud, I'm not just committing voter fraud, I'm committing mail fraud. And guess what? Not only that, let's create penalties that put people in jail for doing that. Seriously, stealing the vote is, I mean, the, the vote is one of the most sacred things there is, okay? So you steal that, it's a little more important than stealing something else, okay? Because you're stealing faith in the integrity of the process. And I think that should be something that we punish seriously and that we take seriously. Unfortunately, Republicans in South Carolina are not doing it. So as I called earlier this week, I'm going to reiterate that call right now. Let's get people in office that are serious about election reform. Because again, if we don't fix it, then we cannot have faith that our elections are being conducted freely, fairly, and where every vote matters and every vote counts. So one of the issues we addressed earlier this week was transparency and officer-involved shootings. And again, people get mad when I use that term. I really don't understand why. Apparently, the woke side of this argument believes that you can't say officer-involved shooting, that that kind of glosses it over, that I should instead say cops murdering people. Okay, that's the woke definition. Now, as somebody who's kind of an impartial, you know, I want the facts, I want to know what happened, I like to find out what happened before I start putting that kind of label on it, okay? So initially, I refer to these events as officer-involved shootings because there's officers, they're involved in shootings. Anyway, the one we covered earlier this week was significant because it was what's called a bad shot, okay? In cop terminology, you got two terms. You got good shot, which means the use of force was justified, the situation called for the officer to draw their gun and, and, and discharge it, in some cases, using deadly force, that's a good shot. A bad shot is a situation where an officer discharges their weapon in a manner that was not justified, that was not warranted based on the circumstances. And again, it's important to remember that these are split second decisions in a lot of cases. People are having to react in a, you know, just instantaneously. It's like you're watching the football games with the referees and you're like, how in the world did they, they miss that? Well, it's happening, you know, so fast in real time uh, so it is difficult, and again, I don't want to be too judgmental, but in the story that we covered this past week, it involved an officer of the Hemingway, South Carolina Police Department who chased a suspect from Williamsburg County over the border heading east into Georgetown County. Um, this was an individual who was unarmed, okay? So that's, again, a very important uh, mitigating factor, if you will, aggravating factor in this case. Unarmed okay, and was fatally shot by this Hemingway officer. Well, that officer has now been charged, charged by the South Carolina State Law Enforcement Division, which investigates all of these shootings, uh, has been charged with manslaughter. And again, that's a serious charge. That's a, could face up to 30 years. And in fact, there's a mandatory minimum of two years in connection with that charge. So the officer here is looking at some serious prison time for what SLED is alleging was a lack of, of judgment in shooting this unarmed uh, motorist. So I've called for the release of all of the video footage related to this incident, whether it's body cam, whether it's dash cam, uh, because again, I believe that's something the public needs to see. These are incidents that involve, you know, sometimes people throw race in the mix, people throw all sorts of different socioeconomic things in the mix. Um, they lead to protests, they lead to just all manner of upheaval in communities, and in some cases across the state. Uh, and in some cases that's justified. If we go back to 2015, the shooting of Walter Scott in North Charleston, South Carolina, that's justifiable rage. It was an unjustifiable shooting, and the rage that came after it was justified. But what we have to do is release the videos in all these situations and let people see. And in, earlier this year in Florence County, video was released from an officer-involved shooting. In that case, it was a, quote, good shot. Again, we're not, not saying anything, any of this is good, but again, cops speak, good shot, which means that, again, in that incident, the use of force was justified. But 
we'll never know whether it's justified or unjustified unless we see the evidence. And so that's why I would once again repeat my call to release the footage from all of these incidents so that the public can know what happened and so that those involved, whether they're right or wrong, can be held accountable. All right, so one of my favorite shows coming up in, in the political world was The West Wing. Uh, and this was aired on NBC back in the early 2000s. At the time, it was considered liberal. I don't, today, I think it's probably pretty much in the middle based on where the, the liberals have gone. So, but at the time, it was considered a liberal show. They actually called it The Left Wing. But it featured uh, first season, which was when Aaron Sorkin was, was the lead writer on the show, one of the great playwrights in America, just a super talented writer. It featured an episode in which the issue of inflation was raised and particularly a secret plan on the part of the fictional president at the time to fight inflation. Now, there's a big difference in what was going on on this fake TV show back in the 2000s and what's going on now. Back then, in, in real life and on TV, the economy was actually growing at a pretty good clip. 2000, right? Things were going pretty well, right? It was before the dot-com bust, but the dot-com bust really wasn't that big of a deal compared to some of the the recessions and depressions we've seen since then, right? I mean, that was sort of a, just a hiccup. But bottom line was back then we had inflation because the economy was growing. And some inflation is good, folks. And this is important to, to remember. We hear the word inflation and people immediately think bad. Well, that's not necessarily bad because, guys, when prices go up for goods and services, that means people are making more money, okay? So the people who make those goods and provide those services are benefiting from the, from the price increase. The problem is you've got to keep it in check. And we've seen over the past couple decades that the optimum rate of inflation is about 2%. 2% a year. If prices increase by about 2% a year, everybody's wages go up accordingly, it all works out. Now, the problem over the last year is that inflation has gone up by 7.5%. Okay, more than three times, almost four times that optimum rate. Uh, and it's starting to have a real impact on people's ability to purchase food, to purchase gas. And again, those are the two most volatile parts of that consumer price index, which is inflation, the measure of inflation. But even if you strip those out, even if you strip out food and gas, you're still looking at a 6% hike in inflation over the last year. And that's, again, three times above where it should be. So why is this a bad thing? I'll tell you what's a bad thing. It's a bad thing because we're not seeing it as a result of economic growth. What we're seeing it from is that they've pumped so much free money into the economy that the value of that money has just fallen off a cliff. And again, I've said this often over the years in reporting on the actions of the Federal Reserve and reporting on the, the raising of the debt ceiling by Republicans and Democrats, because let's be honest, people, ain't nobody clean in Washington, D.C. when it comes to profligate spending and deficit spending. Even Donald Trump, who claimed he was going to reduce the debt and eliminate deficits, exploded them, exploded them. And by the way, he was doing that before COVID, okay, before COVID. But Biden has just poured gasoline on this fire, right? Uh, trillions of dollars being spent, thrown into the economy. And again, we expect there not to be inflation with all this money flying around. Again, the more money that's out there, the less that money's worth. That's the basic truism here. Uh, and we've forgotten that. And that's why we're seeing these huge price spikes, which basically amount to a massive tax increase on all Americans. So if you want to learn more about my thoughts on this, I've been covering this for a while. I'm not the business major, but I know a little bit. But you can check it out on fistnews.com. We've got a story about Joe Biden and his latest inflationary struggles. I want to thank everybody again for taking the time to watch our Week in Review. Uh, if you want to sponsor us and support what we're doing, Andrea at Fitz News, she's got you covered. Andrea Holloway, our Director of Marketing, get in touch with her. She can hook you up. We're looking forward to another busy week next week. Could have some breaking developments on the Murdoch Murders True Crime Saga, so be on the lookout for that. But thanks again for tuning in, and we will see you next week.